the work of a video game developer exists in a sort of high-stress atmosphere that scientists create special suits for. The looming deadlines and mounting pressure from publishers undoubtedly lead to anxiety and frustration. And what better way to blow off a little steam than with casual pettiness? Being the bigger person is all well and good, but it just doesn't offer the same emotional catharsis. Pettiness is a healthy middle ground between active confrontation and simply rising above, making it the best possible course of action to resolve almost any problem. Probably. When developers are worked too hard or rivalries pop up between studios, pettiness is bound to ensue. The nature of video games actually makes it relatively easy for developers to hide such jabs taken at the expense of others, whether as a way of venting their frustration or just having a little fun. And it's this phenomenon that we're looking at today. Some of the following examples are clearly ill-intended, while others are more akin to harmless ribbing. Either way, I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are the 10 pettiest things developers have hidden in video games games. Number 10, Two-Faced Tanner, Grand Theft Auto 3. Although these days it's one of the four most franchises in video games, Grand Theft Auto once had competition. As anyone who's ever heard of GTA, so everyone, knows, the franchise isn't above taking aim at, well, anyone. So, considering the rivalry the franchise once had with the driver games, it's probably none too surprising to learn that Grand Theft Auto 3 included an entire mission designed to mock driver's leading lad, John Tanner. The mission, Two-Faced Tanner, tasked the player with gunning down a strangely animated undercover cop who is pretty much useless out of his car. The character is shown moving in unnatural jerky motions, mocking Reflection's ability, or rather, inability, to animate the driver protagonist. Rockstar also managed to poke fun at the way the driver franchise had, at the time, offered players little to do outside of you know, driving. Having players quite literally lay waste to Reflection's protagonist after delivering such a dismissive description of the character was a pretty scathing barb. But it didn't end there. Not only was GTA 3's Tanner given a female walking animation, but Rockstar North also included a similar character in Vice City, this time very subtly named Dick Tanner. Funny, childish, and oh so petty. Never change, GTA. Never change. Number 9, Timmy Vermicelli. Driver 3. In appropriately petty fashion, reflections weren't about to let Rockstar North's insults slide. After Grand Theft Auto's repeated poking of the bear, 2004 saw Driver 3, or Driv 3R if you want to get dodgy stylization about this, respond in kind. Instead of simply including an easter egg or vague allusion to Grand Theft Auto, Driver 3 took things to a whole different level, a Vice City parody collectathon. Where GTA 3 tasked players with killing Tanner once, Driver 3 challenged players to locate and kill a character named Timmy Vermicelli 30 times. Though the incredibly subtle name may have fooled absolutely no one, Timmy Vermicelli is an obvious stand-in for Vice City's Tommy Vercetti. Wearing a colourfully patterned shirt reminiscent of Vercetti's, Vermicelli is also seen wearing a set of water wings, referencing the GTA protagonist's inability to swim. The insult itself may have been on par with Rockstar's Tanner jokes, but committing to the joke by making Vermicelli a hidden collectible escalated the feud to another level. Sadly, though Reflections may have won the battle of easter eggs, it seems that GTA GTA won the rivalry war. The Driver franchise began to fade into obscurity shortly after, with its most recent release being a 2014 free-to-play smartphone title. Still, full marks for pettiness. Number 8. Welcome Banner – Resident Evil 2 being petty isn't always about delivering insults or voicing frustration. Sometimes, it's just about the acknowledgement of a small mistake. In Resident Evil 2's case, it's certainly the latter. Because instead of poking fun at a rival, the 2019 remake actually takes aim at the original game. In Resident Evil 2's story, Leon Kennedy's first day in the Raccoon City Police Department is rudely interrupted by the spread of the T-Virus, forcing the player to contend with the onslaught of infected zombies. The 1998 version of the classic survival horror title sees Leon's first day marked by a banner that simply says, Welcome Leon, spelt with two L's. In the 2019 remake, however, the same banner can be spotted, now spelled correctly. Instead of simply fixing the mistake though, the banner has a small gap where the second L was removed and the unnecessary letter can be spotted on a desk nearby. Considering that the game was made in Japan, the original English misspelling was forgivable enough, so fixing it by acknowledging the mistake certainly comes off as a little cheeky. As the remake involved a number of the same developers from the original, however, it's far more self-deprecating than it is malicious, making it one hilarious easter egg. 
Number seven, Dead Assassin, The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings. Not all pettiness comes about as a result of a feud or developer frustration. Some is just purely intended to deliver a quick laugh at someone else's expense. Such is certainly true for The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings, a game that delivers a strange and unprompted attack at the Assassin's Creed franchise. Time for a quick history lesson class. Way back in 2011, the Witcher franchise had yet to achieve the widespread acclaim and popularity it now enjoys, while Assassin's Creed was in its heyday. So much like a mutated David taking aim at a white-robed Goliath, The Witcher 2 valiantly attempted to poke fun at the Assassin's Creed franchise by featuring a dead assassin. Early in the game, players can find the corpse of a hooded figure in white robes, dead beside a pile of hay. Surveying the scene, Geralt simply says, Hmm. Guess they'll never learn. The joke, if you can really call it that, is that leaps of faith in the Assassin's Creed franchise are unrealistic, maybe? It's a weird stance to take for a franchise about mutated monster hunters, and it certainly makes the Witcher's pettiness appear far uglier than Geralt's fantastical foes. Number 6, Commander Keen's Remains, Doom 2. For those who aren't familiar with the history of id software, strap in, because the pettiness is at your expense sort of. Before the success of Doom and Wolfenstein 3D, id pioneered the side-scrolling platformer with a character called Commander Keen. Despite being hugely influential, Commander Keen faded into relative obscurity after Wolfenstein 3D and Doom proved massive hits. In 1994's Doom 2, id Software included a secret map by the name of Grocer. In the map's final room, players can find four dead Commander Keen sprites, which they are forced to desecrate in order to complete the level. This renders poor Commander Keen nothing more than a pile of Doom-style giblets with the character's distinctive helmet sat on top. It's certainly a dark way of commemorating Commander Keen, because it quite literally represents the way that Doom and similar titles killed the id Software character. The 2016 remake of Doom paid similar homage by including Commander Keen's helmet found on a spike in Hell. It's a recurring Doom easter egg that's as petty as it is bitter, intended as much as a statement on players' lack of interest in Commander Keen as it is of Doom's role in seeing the character off for good. Rest in power, Commander Keen. Number 5. Destroying Billboards – Mercenaries 2 – World in Flames This entry concerns a sort of pettiness that every person with a beating heart appreciates, an act of malicious compliance so impressive that industry fat cats started shaking in their overpriced loafers. During the development of Mercenaries 2, Pandemic Studios were instructed by EA to include in-game billboards as a form of advertising. Have we fact checked this? Doesn't sound like something EA would do, you know? Doesn't sound like EA at all, huh? Unable to openly defy the publisher, Pandemic obliged, and the billboards were included. In fact, instead of leaving them in the background to torment players with subliminal messaging, Pandemic brought these billboards to the forefront by instructing players to find and destroy every last one. Doing so helped the player achieve the Digital Man trophy, and it also served as a brilliantly subtle way of telling EA where to shove their billboards. Though it may not be petty in the most obvious sense of the word, and the billboards aren't really hidden, obviously they're billboards, the way in which Pandemic went about following EA's instructions should be considered a thing of beauty. Pandemic's rebellion wasn't one that jeopardised Mercenary 2's success, but instead one that made it clear to everyone involved how the developers really felt about the publisher's demands. Number 4. Erasing the Past Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes Hideo Kojima is one of the gaming industry's most brilliant and eccentric figures, though apparently he isn't above a little pettiness from time to time. Kojima's long-standing collaboration with Konami ended in 2015, but in the years leading up to the now infamous split, he dropped a few subtle clues that he was growing frustrated with the publisher. It was during this time that Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes was made, and Kojima managed to make his feelings about Konami very clear. In the Deja Vu mission area, players are tasked with removing the logos of each and every one of Kojima's previous Metal Gear games from various surfaces. It really doesn't take a psychologist to see that Kojima was literally having players erase his past with Konami, as a way of venting his growing frustration. In fact, when examining the logo for Metal Gear Acid 2, one of the Metal Gear games Kojima did not direct, the player is even told, Looks like that's nothing special. It may have been a strange way to tease his impending departure from Konami, but that doesn't make it any less hilarious. It's simultaneously petty and impressively bold, executed in a way that only Hideo Kojima could manage. 
Number three, not so subtle references, Duke Nukem Forever. The Duke Nukem franchise makes for one of gaming's most disappointing stories. The series was once considered brilliantly edgy, but a lengthy and turbulent development saw Duke Nukem Forever, a subpar first-person shooter, descend into nothing more than childish humour. In line with the distinctly unfunny tone of the game, it also features the worst kind of pettiness imaginable. In the years between 1996's well-received Duke Nukem 3D and the 2011 disaster that was Duke Nukem Forever, franchises like Halo Call of Duty and Gears of War had taken Duke Nukem's place as the most popular shooters, so the long-awaited sequel naturally took aim at the usurpers. However, it did so in the least imaginative way possible, having Duke encounter iconic items or elements of those franchises and dismissing them with colourful and distinctly unpleasant language. Instead of starting up a back-and-forth rivalry with its contemporaries, Duke Nukem Forever simply came off as nothing more than petulant and pointlessly offensive. This sort of pettiness also served to alienate the player by decrying some of the most popular games of the day, making Duke Nukem Forever's jokes seem like nothing more than bitter admittances of its own irrelevance. Number 2 No Hopers – Donkey Kong Country 2 – Diddy Kong's Quest for those of you who weren't alive in the 1990s, in order for this entry to make sense, you'll need to know that the rivalry between Nintendo and Sega was once as bitter as the modern day divide between PlayStation and Xbox. More so, in fact, because games were rarely released on more than one console. Instead, both Nintendo and Sega developed a roster of recognisable characters to populate their games, using them as avatars for their rivalry. After beating King K. Rule in Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy and enters the Cranky's Video Game Heroes Hall of Fame, where Nintendo characters can be seen standing atop a podium. Beneath them is a bin labelled No Hopers, and discarded beside it are Sonic the Hedgehog's famous red shoes and Earthworm Jim's gun. As much as it seemed a petty jab at Sega back in 1995, it actually turned out to be sadly fitting. Sonic the Hedgehog proved to be much less successful than Mario in the years that followed, and Earthworm Jim, who wasn't even an exclusive Sega character, faded away into the annals of history. Sega certainly lost their war with Nintendo, so as sad as it may seem, labelling the Sega characters no hopers was fairly justified, if a little petty. And number one, spiteful secret level, Gex. The development of Gex was plagued with difficulties due to time constraints and pressures from publishers, which led to a team of overworked and frustrated developers. Unhappy with the way their work was being treated, and with so many elements of the game being cut, one particular developer named Justin Knorr set about getting his revenge. Knorr reinstated one of his cut segments as a hidden level, complete with a voiceover, explaining that the publisher didn't value the player enough to include it in the finished game. He even went as far as to include a phone number for a company company rep, and encouraged players to call in with complaints. Nor's slightly unhinged but somewhat justifiable actions were discovered in playtesting. He was fired and the level was removed. Though Nor perhaps took his revenge beyond simple pettiness, the extent of his frustration is something that most of us can relate to. Going way beyond passive-aggressive, in his attempts to undermine the publisher, makes Nor something of a folk hero, even if he did encourage people to harass an unsuspecting company rep, who is also just trying to do their job. Two wrongs may not make a right, but Justin Noor's top-notch aggressive pettiness deserves to go down in history, even if it didn't make the finished game.